Welcome everybody. This is Dr. V of BreastCancerConquer.com and founder of the Seven Essential System. So today I'm super excited to have Dr. Walter Longo on our podcast, our, our Wellness Warriors podcast. And I'm really quite a fan of Dr. Longo. I've read his book, The Longevity Diet. If you don't have it, I definitely encourage you to get it. And a little bit about Dr. Longo. He's a global leader in aging and nutrition, and he was actually recognized by Time Magazine as the longevity guru. So that gives you an idea about um, how important his work is. He's uh, the director of the Longevity Institute at the University of Southern California. His studies focus on the mechanisms of aging in simple organisms, in mice, and in humans. He's identified several genetic pathways that regulate aging in simple organisms and reduce the incidence of multiple diseases in mice and humans. The one that I'm most excited about, of course, is that his studies have shown to reverse the course of diabetes and Alzheimer's and to protect cells and improve the treatment of cancer and other diseases in, in mammals. So thank you, Dr. Longo, for taking the time to, to talk with us today. Thank you. All right. So you've, you've, you're known for some groundbreaking research on longevity, and you've just come out with this amazing book here that I mentioned. Can you give us the most important discoveries on longevity and, and some of the key highlights that you bring out in your book? Yes, uh, so we started with the, the genetics, uh, uh, so the genes, what are the genes that control longevity? And, uh, and some year, many years ago, actually, we identified some of the most important ones um, and uh, I understood that they were attached to protein consumption and then these studies on protein consumption. And so it turns out that on, on, on one side, you have, if you have a high protein diet, the high protein diet drives both uh, IGF-1, as uh, insulin-like growth factor one, and something else called TOR, acis kinase. And these are both uh, now recognized to be pro-aging, I mean, they accelerate aging, but they also recognize to be pro-cancer. So there's a number of studies, including our own, suggesting that high protein, high activity of these genes, and high cancer. And on the other side, uh, we described something else called uh, PKA and RAS, and they are uh, linked to sugar. So, um, so now, uh, now we call it the, the sugar pro-aging pathway and the protein pro-aging pathway. And so having lots of or high blood levels of, of sugar and, uh, and uh, high levels of, of certain amino acids and coming from proteins uh, can accelerate the aging process. And, and we had... Uh, and others demonstrate this with um, genetic mutation, for example, in the growth hormone receptor. So if you, to make it simple, if you block all these genes at once by just mutating the, the functional growth hormone, um, in both mice and humans, we show a major effect in, in a major anti-cancer effect. So people that have this mutation in Ecuador that we've been following for a long time, uh, tend to rarely develop cancer, even though the, the relatives living in the same houses develop cancer at, at uh, a normal rate. And, and same thing for mice. That mice that have this mutation uh, seems to be seem to be very much protected against cancer, among other things. So, uh, so this is the genetic of aging. And then, um, of course, nutrition having a diet resulting in low levels of proteins and low levels of sugar uh, in the blood uh, seems to be ideal in, uh, in uh, extending longevity. That's awesome. So when you say low levels of protein, what, what do you refer, give, give our audience an idea of what low level of protein would mean as far as consumption per day? Yeah, so it would mean uh, for, for a hundred uh, pound uh, person, uh, about uh, um, 40 grams, uh, 35, 40 grams of proteins, and so, you know, if, if you go up uh, to 120 pounds and be 20% higher, uh, so it'd be 48 uh, grams. So it's low, but it's recognized by most uh, um, medical association as sufficient. So 0 0.8 grams per kilogram is recognized by almost every organization as sufficient. So stay at the lowest possible, but sufficient uh, mm -hmm. level. And, um, and so this is, if you think about vegetables, it'll be something like, uh, you know, 400 grams of wet uh, uh, chickpeas uh, or a, uh, a uh, filet of salmon. Uh, this would be 
what we provide uh, around 45 grams of protein. Okay. Okay. Very Most people, you know, do much more, right? So many right. Americans may do two to three times that much, and um, and so we and others have shown that people that have high protein diet, um, they uh, uh, this high protein intake at least up to age 65 was associated with uh, a major increase in uh, cancer incidence, and. Uh, and this is also matching the epidemiological data showing that people that have IIGF1, uh, which is driven by protein, again, uh, they have uh, higher rates of, of uh, prostate, uh, prostate cancer, breast cancer, and uh, um, colon cancer. So all these people that are pushing um, other diets that have a lot of high meat content, you know, ketogenic, paleo, all those things, they may be in for a big surprise when they, when they look at the research here. Well, yeah, I think this is, uh, there are so many uh, diets out there and they come from people that uh, a lot of the times don't really understand uh, much about diet and, and certainly not, they don't understand much about nutrition for longevity. They may have uh, uh, some background in nutrition, but not nutrition for, for longevity. And that's really what you want. It's really pointless to lower somebody's cholesterol and lower somebody's uh, triglycerides and maybe some weight uh, if then the long-term consequences are increased cancer and maybe increased Alzheimer's disease, right? So this is why this old idea of letting people that have limited understanding of, of nutrition uh, give recommendation is just it's just that an old idea it needs to be replaced with with this uh, uh, what happens if you eat like that for your entire life short term and long term and um, and and it has to be based on I in the book I talk about uh, five pillars you know and the five pillars are really important for every decision we make so what do epidemiological studies show what about clinical studies what about basic research focus on longevity and then what about um, centenarians, right? If a diet, like you mentioned, the paleo diet or whatever, if you look around the world, um, whether it's Okinawa or Loma Linda or Sardinia, the, the places that have record longevity, none of them have high protein diet, none of them have high red meat diet, uh, none, right? Not the, the minority, none of them. So, uh, so then you have to wonder, well, why, why is it that if, if this had some advantages, uh, then nobody that is long lived uh, adopts this. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. So, so what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people make in terms of eating? Well, the number one, I think, is uh, what's been recommended for decades now by, by the medical community, which is uh, eat five times a day, right? So it's right. clearly been associated with uh, an epidemic of obesity, of overweightness, all kinds of diseases. So it's a bad idea. Um, you know, now you could argue that if we did a clinical trial and people were fed five times a day exactly what you needed to feed them uh, or, or less, um, I think you know, it's possible that it will have some benefits. But the reality out there is that if, when people are told to eat five times a day, they're, they're going to overeat and they're going to extend the eating period, right? So then they're going to eat for 14, 15, 16 hours a day. Uh, also because they might get to 8 p.m., maybe you have a busy day, you get to 8 p.m., you, haven't, you only eat twice, and you're thinking, oh, I must have a couple of other meals because the doctor told me that um, this is uh, not, not enough. You know? and, and so, of course, then you eat until midnight. Uh, this is bad for, for metabolic disorders. Uh, it's bad for sleep. It's bad in general. Uh, so in the book, I recommend eating you know, three times a day plus a snack if you're normal weight and you don't have any problems, um, but eat twice a day. So breakfast and lunch or breakfast and dinner plus a low calorie healthy snack. Uh, and that's it, you know, sorry, like two and a half time until um, you don't have a weight problem or a weight, a trend for weight, gaining weight problem. You know, I, I've used it myself for, for 20 years and I can tell you, me and all the people that I have uh, doing this, uh, if they follow it, they have very little problems on weight. Okay, so that brings us to the fasting mimicking diet. You know, there's a lot of talk about intermittent fasting and only eating, you know, after 1 p.m. during the day. And uh, in your book, you have a, the whole section on the fasting mimicking diet, and you've created a program, which I'm going to share. I've shared with my audience here. 
is actually a five-day fasting mimicking meal program, which is plant-based, and it's been awesome. I did it a few weeks ago and really enjoyed it. Lost a few pounds, not that I needed to, but just uh, definitely felt like my body was on a fast. So tell us about the fasting mimicking diet. Yes. First, I want to comment on eating after 1 p.m., and, and I talk about that in the book, and, and that's a mistake, again, uh, not uh, covering all the pillars. And um, if you look at the data, for example, multiple studies are suggesting that if you skip breakfast, skipping breakfast is associated with increased cardiovascular disease and increased mortality. So not a good idea to eat after 1 p.m. Um, and now you could argue as much as people want about why that, but if, if, if you're doing something that it not only is not associated with positive effects, but with negative effects, it's a bad start, right? No matter how, what you can argue about the, the way that it was done. So, you know, I talk about time the feeding, which is very good, but I talk about 12 hours and not 16 hours. 12 hours seems to be over and over and over associated with positive effects. So 8 a.m., 8 p.m., 7 a.m., 7 p.m. Now, the fasting making diet is, um, you know, really the result of, of decades of work by my lab and, and really is something that I always thought, I was a student of Roy Walford, one of the gurus of, of calorie restriction um, and, uh, and sort of saw the power of eating less, but the problems associated with eating less all the time. And the, and the periodic fasting making diet was really trying to bring the technology to the, uh, but also history to this uh, um, longevity uh, uh, effort. So how do you get somebody to live longer, healthier, without losing a lot of weight, without being weak, without being frail, and, uh, and maybe immunosuppressed, right? So, uh, so that's a fasting making diet, something that you can do for five days every, let's say four months on average. And, and that really now allows the, the compliance to be, uh, to be, um, you know, a pass, uh, I mean, it's a real possibility to have a large per percentage of the population being able to do it. And, um, and so, and you know, the, this is a, a, a plant-based, uh, low calorie, but not extremely low calorie. Um, and uh, so people can, can uh, have their regular meals and, and uh, you know, try to get as close as possible to what would be uh, a normal day of eating, but get the, at the same time the benefits of fasting or many of the benefits of fasting. And that's, uh, that's what we were able to achieve in the clinical trial uh, with over 100 patients uh, uh, confirms that, um, you know, cycles of this, three cycles of this now lowers cholesterol, blood pressure, triglyceride, uh, fasting glucose. So m most of the pre-diabetic uh, patients went back to the normal glucose, blood glucose levels. And people that had the infl uh, systemic inflammation returned to the normal um, levels of CRP, C-reactive protein. And uh, also another advantage of the FMD has been the uh, targeting uh, visceral fat preferentially and not touching or, or have minimal effects on the lean body mass and in, in fact increasing the relative lean body mass. So people are actually building muscle and, um, and, uh, um, or maintaining mu normal muscle mass while they're reducing the, uh, the uh, visceral fat, the belly fat. So, so yes, a powerful uh, intervention and I, I hope that we start seeing doctors uh, um, and, and dietitian uh, considering this in the prevention of cancer, in the prevention of cancer recurrence, but also, you know, in general to make people live uh, longer, healthier. Absolutely. And, and I've recommended fasting, especially um, for not just for longevity, but we know that the effects of fasting can be so beneficial. And I will say that when I did the fasting mimicking diet and the, the prolonged plan, the food is really good. Your olives, the olives from Spain are so delicious. And the well, soups are great. And it was, it was really enjoyable to do because some people are afraid just to do a plain water fast. Yeah. And this really also came from the, my effort to make a patient centered, right? Mm -hmm. Not commercial. I pushed the company. I don't make a penny out of it. And that's why I was able to basically say, let, we need to make a something Forget how much you're going to make out of it. Uh, uh, we need to make something that people can do. And, uh, you know, and that's where, you know, the effort of trying to make it, you know, put the olives in and put the, 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 the soups that are tasty 
and put the nuts and the bars and the, even some uh, treats, I think that may not necessarily be ideal for the diet. And people say, oh, but th there is one component that has got, you know, six grams of sugar. And I say, you know, that's okay. That, the six grams are okay. We, it's, calcul it's a calculated uh, uh, addition. And we have it there because we don't want people to say, I'm never going to do this again because we rather lose 10% of the effect or 5% of the effect. But have somebody saying, you know what, I could do it every four months. I can come back and do it again. And, uh, um, it, you know, of course, I did it also for myself because I did water-only fasting. And I had a terrible, terrible time doing it. And I, I mean, I was, uh, I think, traumatized by it. <laughs> and, uh, and so I said, you know, I can't do this. And so I really need this routine. I need the tea. I need the, uh, I need, I need this variety. And I need the to little to chocolate, the little piece of chocolate at the end of the day. <laughs> exactly. I mean, little things like that, that, mm -hmm. that make you think, okay, not exactly what I would want to eat otherwise, but, but I can definitely do this, particularly if it's only every several months. Yes. Very good. Now, what's the effect of uh, the fasting mimicking diet on cancer prevention and treatment? Because that's really a very important message for our, our audience. Yeah, so now for treatment, we have several trials that, are, that have been published. There's another one that is about to be published uh, by Charité Hospital. And, you know, involving maybe about 100 patients and showing uh, protective effects of the fasting mimicking diet against uh, side effects. Uh, there's still nothing um, published on the uh, efficacy against cancer. The, the, the mouse data is very powerful, but we have to see the, the human data before knowing uh, that part. Then uh, for prevention, in the trial, we showed uh, a decrease, a long-term decrease in IGF-1, one of the markers and prob probable risk factors for cancer, uh, as I was saying earlier, associated with uh, many different types of cancers. And uh, so that's good news for somebody trying to prevent cancer and prevents cancer coming back. And in the mice, uh, uh, when we started feeding mice in middle age with the fasting making diet, we show the 45% uh, decrease in, in uh, not only the mice live longer, but they had uh, nearly half of the cancers, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you can see dramatic effects in sort of blocking cancer in, in, the, in the initial months of the diet versus uh, the control mice getting a lot of, a lot of the cancer. And um, so the human data is supportive uh, with the risk factor. The mouse data demonstrates uh, the effect of the fasting making diet on, on cancer prevention. And now in, uh, in Palermo, University of Palermo, we're about to start, we have some funds now to start a, a trial on BRCA, BRCA1, BRC2 wow. patients. And basically we're gonna give them the fasting making diet once a month. And, uh, and the idea is, uh, can we uh, postpone or possibly uh, prevent um, the, um, the uh, you know, genetic uh, cancers in, in these people that have a very high uh, chance of developing uh, uh, these women that have a high chance to, uh, of developing breast cancer. Not just women, by the way. You know, also a few men can mm -hmm. develop breast cancer because of this mutation. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So in a nutshell, what are some of the things that people should eat more of and less of on a daily basis? Yes. Um, so first of all, uh, oh, I, we always get uh, complaints by people saying, um, oh, but you're talking about uh, pasta in the book, uh, but I'm gluten intolerant. Well, of course, if you're gluten intolerant, you should, have, you should avoid gluten. And there are some people that, you know, are for whom certain vegetables are pro-inflammatory and they should avoid it. You know? so, but if everybody else, um, uh, then it should be a high a legume diet, so beans, uh, uh, chickpeas, uh, peas, etc. And they should be, uh, most of the proteins, uh, daily proteins should be from that and from fish, the salmon, the sardines, the anchovies, uh, fish that is low in mercury, high in omega-3 fatty acids, and high in nourishment, you know, B12, etc. So this should be two or three times a week. And then, uh, of course, lots of vegetables, not a lot of fruit, right? People always think veg fruits and vegetables, but it's really vegetable and some fruit. Why? Well, tons of sugar, tons of fructose in the, sh in the, in the uh, fruit. It's okay to have some fruit, no problem. I use, I use the dry fruit as my, my dessert, right? That's how I usually have dessert. 
So yeah, fruit is fine. Uh, but this idea of fruits and vegetables, I think promoted uh, to some people means eating seven oranges a day and, and, a, and a pound of, of, of strawberries. And of course, if you do that, um, you, could, you have some benefits, but you have some problems and at the end uh, may, may uh, sort of neutralize itself. So better to go with the vegetables if possible, uh, of course, uh, organic, um, but, uh, and, and some, having some nuts uh, every day, almonds, hazelnuts, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, other type of nuts, are, most of them are fine. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's good and uh, olive oil a number of studies suggesting that uh, maybe 50 grams or so of olive oil a day so an abundant uh, use of that on salads and and and, and uh, other meals is is good and you know for the for the starches uh, people confuse carbohydrate with starches with sugar i mean and i'm amazed and this is really comes from this chaos created by all these experts that know very little about uh, nutrition and so carbohydrates are good. In the book, I talk about 60, 30, 10. 60% 60 carbohydrate, 30% fats, 10% protein. Uh, but the carbohydrate should not be tons of starches, you know, bread, pasta, rice. It should be you know, veg vegetables and legumes. They contain lots of carbohydrate. You know, be, uh, people don't understand that. So if you have most of the carbohydrate coming from that, and then you know, I talk about you know, having a limited level. So if you have a, a dish that has, 50 grams of, of pasta and 300 grams of legumes and 150 grams of vegetables, uh, that's an ideal uh, dish. Now you have limited starches, uh, no sugars, and uh, lots of carbohydrates of the, of the good kind coming with a lot of nourishment. And, and that's, uh, I think that's the, an example of ideal diet. And you can have versions with, with rice and, and other uh, starches. And, and that's important because, as I was saying earlier about the, the treat for the fasting making diet, that's the same way. Say, so if you, I'm Italian, if you took away the 50 grams of pasta, I'm going to start not liking that dish. <laughs> uh, but, you know, of course, people all over the world now have these dishes covered with the rice and pasta. And that's really having, you know, five spoons of sugar. Right? It, it just doesn't make any sense. It's, it's just something that maybe kids could do, but. Uh, nobody else should do, and even kids. Of course, now you have obesity in, in children and, and diabetes in children. So not even not even for children should you have any more these uh, starch-covered uh, dishes that are so common everywhere in the world. Yeah, and that's why we see the rise of obesity and so many other diseases like Alzheimer's and diabetes. All right. So our last question then is about exercise and moving our body. So I know you you talk about that in your book as well. So what's your what's your view on um, exercise and moving our bodies every day? Yes. Uh, so the view, um, as I try to do in the book with everything else, is really based on pillars, and so uh, on the five pillars. And so I, I recommend 150 minutes a week. And this is based on meta analysis of the people that went and looked at all the studies that on exercise and longevity, not just how well they did for six months, but how long did they live? If people that, that exercise 150 minutes a week, and then if you look at 300 minutes a week, you don't really see a big improvement from 150 minutes. I say, stick with 150 minutes, that's fine. That means like, whatever, 20 minutes a day, 40 minutes every other day, um, and then, you know, have maybe on the weekend, if you can, uh, something, uh, it's a couple hours of, of, of some type of, uh, you know, exercise. Now, if you look at centenarians, they don't really exercise, but they're just very active. Mm -hmm. uh, so the ones that are very successful may have walk uphill a lot, take stairs a lot. And so th that's also very important. And so pick places that are far away from you. You know, we really got used to uh, saying, oh, let's pick something that is very close by to have lunch or to have coffee. And instead of saying, let's pick something that is far away to have coffee and lunch. And that, that if you get used to that, it just uh, forces you and in a natural way to to take a walk and, and, um, and uh, you know, maybe do an hour a day of, of walking minimum. That's what I noticed in Europe when I went to Europe several times is that people walk everywhere. And so if you have a big meal and you're walking 30 minutes an hour back to your apartment or your home, then you're getting in your exercise every day. Well, yeah, I have to say people used to walk and now you see <laughs> that Europe also doing a lot less of that. Yes, yes. 
So once again, The Longevity Diet by Dr. Walter Longo. So thank you so much for your time, Dr. Longo. I know you're a very busy man and I appreciate so much all the research that you're doing and uh, I'll be doing the uh, fasting mimicking diet every month for the next, well, two more months I wanna try it and then I'm gonna measure my blood work and see what kind of positive changes I've experienced. So thank you for your work. Thank you and I wanna point out people that wanna follow, we. Uh, we publish pa papers, we cover papers published by others on my Prof. Walter Longo uh, Facebook uh, page. So if they want to be updated on some of the things we're doing, but also some of the new research that's coming out, they can go to PROF Walter Longo uh, Facebook page. Okay, very good. And we'll post all those links when we, when we publish the podcast. Okay, okay, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.